Um, so today we're going to be looking at some exam questions, uh, the exam question that I set for you guys on Google Classroom, but if you're not 100% familiar with it, here it is. So using game theory and the information provided in figure one and extract A, discuss the effects on firms of cutting prices in an oligopolistic market. So this is the 2019 paper three a level paper, so paper three, micro and macro, and it is section A, question C, the 12 mark question. So um, when I'm looking at figure one and extract A, figure one is the breakdown of the market structure um, of crisps and extract A is looking at the advertising ban. Um, I'm working on my editing skills, so um, depending on how well those editing skills are or aren't going, I should be able to maybe potentially have that up in the corner, but probably not. There's probably nothing in the corner right right now, but we'll see. Um, so the first thing we're going to look at is structure. The second thing that we have a look at is potential content, and the third thing we look at is um, evaluation. Uh, we're going to have a look at marks breakdown. Now I was an examiner on this paper, so um, I know it pretty well. I, I marked hundreds of them, so uh, I'll be giving you kind of some tips and tricks as we go through. So the first thing that we are going to have a look at is the structure for this 12 mark question. So um, the structure itself looks a little bit like this. So there are two potential structures that you can use and actually it's up to you which one you use. I would never give a set of students and tell them that they have to use one or the other structure because actually the structures tend to lend themselves to different questions quite well. So the first structure is you can do two analysis and two evaluation. Now these two evaluation will be very short, just kind of like two or three sentences, um, sharp kind of evaluation for your um, each analysis point that you do, or you can do two analysis point and one evaluation, so one extended evaluation that goes into a little bit more depth, right? Now, it's up to you which one you do. Like I said, it for me anyway, it very much depends on the type of question rather than the um, kind of structure that you always go for. Now obviously we know that our 12 mark question, this is true for paper one, paper two and paper three, is our levels based answers. They are not points based like the five and the eight markers that we have gone through before. So they're levels based and I've got the levels here. So for your analysis you have three separate levels, level one, level two, level three. And for your evaluation you've just got level one and level two. Now that changes for the 15 mark where you have that third level of evaluation. Um, and that's kind of where the difference really lies. You get a lot of questions about what is the actual difference between a 10 mark, a 12 mark and a 15 mark. Well at least for me, the 12 mark and the 15 mark, I'm expecting to see a lot of difference in the evaluation and also in just the depth of knowledge. So um, the marks breakdown, it looks like this. So level one, you're getting one to two marks, level two, three to five, and then level three, six to eight. Now, from, like, just to kind of break that down a little bit more, now when you're getting your worked marks and you get that mark back, you can see where you've kind of ended up here and here. Right? Now that's important because as you move forward when you're you know, in year 12, where you are at the moment, you will be concerned about your actual overall mark. But actually, as you move closer to your exam, you're probably going to end up being more concerned about your level, what um, kind of depth of analysis, depth of evaluation you are getting to, and you will be working on improving those levels. Um, for evaluation, there's four marks for evaluation overall, and that's split evenly between level one and level two. And I'll go into kind of depth of what do I expect for level one and level two, the same as level one, two, level two and level three in analysis. Now, you will see on mark teams you may have looked at already or from your teachers where they put it up on the board or where I put it up from the board, um, that there are some cases where you are blocked out of levels or if you don't include certain things, you won't be able to access certain levels. And they're on the mark scene, they're just in bold and MB, but they're kind of the must include to access a level. And actually this exam question is a good exam question. It's a good example of an exam question because there is a uh, must include in this as well. So um, think about maybe what the must include uh, might be 
probably pretty obvious for this question, but there are lots of cases, and this is true of all level-based questions. This might be true of the 10, the 12, the 15, and the 25. So it may well be that students are not allowed into certain um, levels because of they haven't put something that was explicitly asked for, or they haven't included something that might be like incredibly obvious um, in the question or in their um, kind of like in-depth analysis or evaluation. So, the first thing we're going to look at is our analysis, or the next thing we're going to look at is our analysis. So, um, for this question, your kind of must include was game theory matrix or kinked demand curve. Now, if you're slightly confused as to why you can use a kinked demand curve, I recommend you go and have a look at the game theory and kinked demand curve video that I did, because you can see in that video that actually they're exactly the same thing. Right? So you can include either one and that's fine, as long as you are relating that theory. So um, when I was marking this question, I was quite surprised, but um, it does make complete sense that actually if you, a student did use correct game theory and their analysis, their points of analysis were um, logical, then automatically we were kind of looking at level three for them. So automatically we were looking at level three marks. Now that might be seen for some of you like, oh well, that's quite easy, but actually you'd be surprised at how many students didn't manage to get that because of their game theory matrix. Now, equally, if you didn't do a game theory matrix that was correct, and I'll go through exactly what I'm looking for in that game theory matrix to, um, to show you exactly what I mean when I say correct, then you wouldn't be able to access level three, so you'd be blocked in that kind of level two, potentially level one, depending on what you put. So what is a correct um, game theory matrix? Because you would have used, I imagine, unless you are mentally in sync, um, where you would have used different numbers to me. So the kind of thing that I would expect to see is, one, you must show your incentive to break. So for um, walkers or KP, I put walkers in KP because obviously you need to reference figure um, one, reference figure one. Um, so I use walkers in KP here. Um, for walkers, you need to show uh, 10, 17, 3 and 8, and um, here is obviously your incentive to break from keeping it the same to cutting. So otherwise, your Nash equilibrium would actually be keeping it the same rather than cutting. I'm thinking about maybe doing a video just on kind of like common mistakes with game theory, king demand curve, and some of the things that we've gone through. Um, so you can see uh, how students have done things wrong or things that I'm used to seeing when um, students have kind of made little mistakes here and there. So you need the incentive to break and equally you need the incentive to break for the other firm, KP, 10 to 17, so that here is the incentive to break. Because if you don't have that incentive to break, then you won't end up where both of them are cutting their prices. And that's very simple because you've got 10, 17, 3 and 8 obviously cutting their prices. They are best off in any situation, so they're going to cut their prices and exactly the same here, so they end up cutting their prices. Now that's where your analysis, your supporting analysis comes in. So um, there were, just thinking about my head, some really good examples that I marked during that time. Um, so some really good examples where a student had done a game theory matrix at the top of their um, answer, and then had done two analysis points based on that game theory matrix, and their first analysis point was very much to do with this one here, so the idea of independent firm decision making, so they will make their decision based on the other person in the firm and therefore overall they will end up with lower profits in the market because remember it us on firms not on consumers right so for consumers it may well be lower prices but for firms the outcome is actually lower profits so their first kind of analysis point really breaking that game theory matrix down going through the theory and showing me that they understood or whatever examiner they had that they understood exactly what they had produced here, they hadn't just wrote, learned something. So they kind of breaks that down, and then their second analysis point could have been shorter, and they could have spoken about, you know, um, firms make up prices to expand their market share because they can't advertise to expand market share, therefore they have to, or advertise to under 16s, therefore they have to do other things, therefore cutting prices would allow them to gain some market share, um, and that's why they may end up cutting prices um, and having lower profits in the short run, but potentially if they cut prices then increase their market share, we'll get onto the evaluation in a moment. All firms uh, make less profit overall was a really key point of analysis that I would, I would have been looking for. So um, really your whole analysis just stems around your knowledge and application. Now obviously you have to here kind of 
inc include all of that data. So you do have to include Walker's KP, you do have to include that the advertising bans on under 60s, you do have to include all of those things and relate this answer to the case study that you are given and you also need to create some chains of reasoning. So one of the ways that you can create those chains of reasoning is to kind of give you um, an example. You could say here's your game theory matrix and one of the impacts um, for firms is that they may end up making less profit. This is because the advertising ban on under 18s for under 16s means that firms cannot access a market that is quite large for them. This means that they may have to shift from non-price competition to price competition. So if they shift to price competition, this means that they have to cut prices from however much it is in the market to however much they may cut it by to gain some additional market share. This may mean that other firms in the market respond to this and end up cutting their prices as well. Therefore, firms may keep their market share but might end up with less profits, right? And that would be your step-by-step -step analysis kind of breaking that down. Um, you could have used a kink demand curve as well, kind of showing that firms will end up kind of engaging in non-price competition um, and therefore moving to the kind of inelastic part of their demand curve. That would have been fine. Um, I will just reiterate again if you're confused as to why those two things um, link, just have a look at the other video. So there's your analysis and um, that's how you're, you're kind of looking at level two and um, level three. If you're looking at level two, level one, then you're looking at kind of short, maybe misconstrued. If I had a student that hadn't done the incentive to break, but they'd explained it quite well, I might give them top level two. If I had a student who just completely got this wrong, but then their theory was correct, then I may well have also given them kind of mid-level two. If I had a student that had just written a couple of sentences, but that sentence very knowledge-based, but was, was relatively accurate, but only, you know, kind of one or two sentences might have got level one. Um, so that's kind of how we break down how you get the different levels, level one, two, and three. Thank you. Um, so now we're going to have a look at our evaluation. So again, just to reiterate, you could have done two um, pieces of evaluation or you could have done one very in-depth piece of evaluation. Um, it was uh, up to you. I personally think this question really lends itself well to doing one extended piece of evaluation. Right, and I've got some potential evaluation points that you could have done on the board um, here. Is it a board? More like a flip chart, but um, they're here either way. So Walker's the main point of evaluation that I saw, which is really good evaluation, really good for bringing in some of that theory, really good for bringing in a lot of that um, kind of the data that is available to you. And also really thinking about how evaluation works in economics. So I always say that the analysis is ceteris paribus, in theory, on paper, this is exactly what would happen. And then your evaluation is just far more kind of, but actually in reality that doesn't happen because things aren't ceteris paribus, we don't hold everything constant, and actually the reality might be completely different. And this first point, which is the point that I saw mainly in um, the paper three, is a really good point to kind of make for that, which is walkers have a much larger market share than anybody else. So even though we can say that it is an oligopoly structure, actually there is a monopoly within that. And that monopoly has a lot of market power and it's a very large brand. Their demand curve is far more inelastic than other firms' demand curves. And because of that, even if KP decide to reduce their price, Walkers may still con uh, keep their market share, consumers may not decide to switch because Walkers itself is a brand. And you can bring in a lot of theory for that um, and data um, from the case study from that. So you, I think they have 53% market share. I don't have the data in front of me. I might be completely wrong on that, but I'm, I think it's around that. Um, market share, so you could bring that as your application into that question. Uh, and this, this here was the most common piece of evaluation that we had. Um, you could have said that actually, Firms might end up tacitly colluding even though they can't advertise and the reason they might do that is because um, in the long run it's not, it's not good for them to cut prices and enter into a price war. They don't want to do that. Price wars are bad for the firms um, and consumers in the long run but obviously we're focusing on firms. 
um, price wars are bad for firms and therefore they might not want to enter into that price war, they might not want to enter into the point where they end up getting profit and they might just sit tacitly colluding um, on that kind of kinked point or on that kind of 10 and 10 point because um, waiting because they're just waiting for the other firm to react right so actually they might end up staying at that point that was another piece of valuation that we saw a lot and, and is a very very good piece of evaluation or you could have said that the advertise actually break it down a little bit further and look at what actually is happening and that advertising ban or that advertising restrictions are all to do with children and that under 16 market and actually how much of these firms market is under 16 and how much of it is adults and the adult market can carry on with with non-price competition they don't have to enter into a price competition situation they can stay um, advertising you know on, on adult TV shows they can advertise um, in kind of non-price advertising in other ways to brand loyalty or increasing brand loyalty, using celebrity endorsements that appeal to adults rather than children. Um, they can, you know, advertise post wall shed. All of those things allow them to, to actually keep on non-price advertising in the adult market. Um, and that would have been absolutely um, fine as a valuation as well. So, Thinking about evaluation, think about how we mark evaluation, or you know, I mark evaluation under the guide of, of whoever is in charge of me marking. Um, looking at level two, I would like to see like extended, in-depth, applied um, evaluation. So any of the ways that I just explained those three points would have been you know high level two for marks. Um, low level two is maybe they haven't really applied it properly, or maybe it's not really there isn't that extension. Um, level one would just be a kind of, it might be correct, but it might just be like a statement or a couple of statements. It's not applied and it's also not critical. Level two evaluation requires you to be critical of the information that's provided. So, you know, talking about, well, walkers actually might have a little bit of monopoly here and their demand curve might be more inelastic than other KP's demand curve. Actually, that, that's quite critical and that's a really good way to think about all of these three points um, and also remember that these are just some of the stuff that you could have written there are always going to be some other points that you could write about but actually like aren't on here but they're perfectly correct and you would have got full marks for right those are the answers that we enjoy reading the most sometimes because they're kind of left field and really interesting and critical so just because you might have written something that isn't on these pieces of paper doesn't necessarily mean that it is wrong um, it might just be that it's slightly different. So thank you so much for um, watching and I hope that you understand 12 mark questions a little bit more now. And uh, yeah, so thank you so much. Bye.